This is part two in a two-part series discussing the ADA programming language, its recent boom, NVIDIA's involvement, and the new ISO 26262 reference process. Along the way, we've introduced AdaCore, the company responsible for giving developers the tools to develop in this unique and useful language. If you haven't watched it, there'll be links down below available for you to view it. Otherwise, let's roll. Quinton, thank you very much for joining me in the studio for our part two. Thank you, Ian. Okay, so in part one, we introduced Ada as a language to our viewers. A lot of people like myself hadn't heard of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we introduced sort of what Ada Core is, which is who you work for, which is a valuable service for engineers who are developing using Ada. We also talked about how Ada is really used today. So go ahead and watch that video if you haven't already, because it's going to give you a great backstory to what we'll be talking about today. So just to provide some context for those who haven't watched that video and refuse to, what is Ada? And where would the language be if it wasn't for you at AdaCore? Whoa, 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 hold there. Only 12% of you are subscribed. Do yourself a favor and subscribe for daily engineering content. All right. So Ada, uh, it's an interactive language. Uh, from the execution semantic standpoint, it's very close to C++. You have procedure, um, you, you mm -hmm. have precontation, you have statements, conditions, and all of this good stuff, right? But the difference is that on top of that, you're going to have a lot of specification, a, a lot of information on what the code is supposed to be doing and what constraint is putting in there. Uh, what that's going to give you are ways to sort of self-verify uh, the code in a way. Like you're going to have tools that are going to rely on this information, including and starting with the compiler itself, and verifying that the software is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is immensely important in, in safety and security and reliability uh, situations overall. Now, to your second yeah. question, uh, where would Ada be? If you go back to what AdaCore was at the beginning, the company was uh, founded uh, as a way to support the open source implementation of the Ada programming language. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. founders of AdaCore were the very people that developed that very first open source implementation on top of GCC. Um, and then, you know, we pride ourselves into maintaining this open source compiler over the years. So, to, to a large respect, if AdaCore wasn't there, I think that there would not be an open source implementation available to everyone on the Ada language. And uh, I personally do not think that the language can survive out there uh, without an open source uh, implementation. So Ada would be around most definitely. It would be much more confidential. It would be used based on proprietary implementations. And I believe that if Ada core wasn't there, uh, you and I wouldn't be talking about the Ada language and its future in particular right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, right. Wow. You've read my mind. My next question for you is where is Ada going to be used into the future? Okay. So uh, again, you need to look at why you would want to use Ada today. You would want to use Ada today because you care about safety, cybersecurity, reliability, and you know that if your software fails, you're going to have big, big problems. If you take the example yeah. of a car, uh, if your software fails, depending on which software, people may die. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. But even the best, very serious consequences. You have massive recalls that are hugely expensive. So you're going to want to yeah, develop this software in a way that minimizes as much as possible software issues. And this is the case for automotive, but you'll see the same in aerospace and defense, medical and certain industrial domain and so on. What are the places where you're going to see Ada in particular when you have embedded systems, because those are notoriously very difficult to test, very difficult to, you know, to uh, maintain over time. And fixing them is not just like a patch that you can download from your computer. Fixing the system can be some Someone sometimes, I'm sorry, uh, straight out impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now going back, if, if if you don't mind, going back to this uh, reliability and safety and so on and so forth. I've talked about the fact that you can add to the language that could that specification and constraints, right? And you can vary the that the compiler will verify some. You will insert checks. You have tools that will verify things for you. But what Ada mm -hmm. enables you to do is something that goes above and beyond what everything else can do in the industry. It's something called formal methods. And for that, right. yeah, for that you're going to use something called Park, which is a fairly large subset of the Ada language. Yeah. For those who haven't heard of formal methods, would you just give us a, a 10, 20 second update about what this is? Absolutely. I was going there. So, um, so um, the idea of formal methods is that you're going to look at your program. You're going to mathematically analyze the program. 
and you're going to test whether certain properties are true or not. And the kind of properties that you care about in the context of uh, your software are going to be reliability or safety properties. For example, something that is relatively simple to prove is absence of buffer overflow. Now, now think of what that means. Yeah. The cybersecurity industry where, what, 80% of their issues are memory-related issues uh, before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like that. Exploits have been involving that, yes. This is eliminated with uh, with formal methods. And this is not eliminated dynamically. Like, you don't get stuff that verify, oh, is my index in my array or, or not? And if not, I... no, 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 no. You're going to statically verify that there's no such issue whatsoever. And that's just the, the easy stuff, right? Then you can move on to uh, including any kind of exception raised in your program and demonstrate that there's no exception whatsoever that is going to be raised. And then the next step, which is start to be the very interesting one, is that you can define your own properties. Uh, and then you're going to verify that those properties are verified, are whole, regardless of how your software is going to be uh, called. Those are typically assertions, right? Boolean expressions that you insert in the code. Now contrast that with traditional verification methodology. If you do testing, you're going to do that. A handful of tests and you're going to call it a day, right? Uh, what tells you that there's not this very particular value in your program that's going to do something that you don't expect. It's, it's, it's a hard problem. It's an impossible problem to solve, generally speaking. But if you use formal methods, you're going to verify that regardless of the way the software is being used, those properties will hold. Those, those assertions that you wrote, they will never fail. And that's an incredibly, incredibly powerful uh, statement on the quality and reliability of your software. Yeah. Now, can we switch gears for a minute? There's some very exciting news about one of the biggest tech giants right now showing a lot of interest in ADA. Mm -hmm. And so you at ADA Core have recently worked with NVIDIA. What, what, what is driving their interest in ADA and Spark? And I guess my other question is, why now? So uh, why now is an interesting question. Maybe you hear it now because there's a big news right now, but we've been working with NVIDIA and publicizing, but I work with them for over five, six years now. Uh, um, uh, we have, we have um, you know, there are documents with them that we publish, webinars. If you look at DEF CON talks, they have at least three DEF CON talks, mm -hmm. I think, uh, where they describe what they do with Ada and Spark. The initial interim of NVIDIA was for firmware. So, you know, like this, this software that runs extremely close to the hardware, where you really want uh, to have the highest level of uh, confidence, in particular from a cybersecurity standpoints. They, 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 they wanted to make sure that some pieces of their firmware was rock solid and that, for example, uh, you have absolute certainty of absence of memory issues such as uh, buffer overflow and various other things. So that was the first drive and they started to, to, to develop that and deploy that in, in various places. And as we were working with them, we eventually also uh, got acquainted with the automotive group, the, the, the group that develops the software stack on top of the uh, hardware that is aimed at uh, automotive, in particular self-driving cars and, and stuff like that. And their interest was uh, a bit similar, but also a bit different. Like whilst firmware is really uh, anxious about cybersecurity, automotive is also anxious about safety and they wanted to see to which extent they could adapt the way they develop software to integrate more robust and perhaps more effective methodologies uh, including formal proof in the way of developing software and when it comes to using formal proof with imperative languages uh, ada spark is pretty much the only industrial grade option out there so you know they, they engage there and that's what leads us to the discussion we're having today so the video that we had before this and also during this video, we've spoken about ISO 26262. Now, by the way, are you a 26262 man or a 26262? This is an important question. I tend to speak uh, fast and love calls, so I love to keep if it's better than 26262 for that unique reason. Okay, cool. Okay, we'll run with that. What do you feel is the importance of this reference process, ISO 26262, and how can Spark help with that certification? So I'm going to take the question out of order. Uh, Start okay. in the battle. It's absolutely paramount to ensure the safety of your system. You need to understand that in the automotive, you have a, a mosaic of people working together. You have your like your, your, your OEMs that make the actual car, then they're going to have 
uh, tier one that are going to provide components and software, right? Uh, but even talking, about how do you ensure that the software that you're going to put into car is going to be sufficiently reliable so that you can entrust the life of people with it, right? And the answer to that, you need a bar. You need to, to say, I need this level of confidence before I allow people to drive this car, before I uh, allow to deliver this software and so on and so forth. And that's what ISO 26.2 gives you. It really it tell you, you need to do this much test, this much review, this much requirements. You need to be able to uh, trace requirements to, to test to make sure you don't miss anything. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a massive endeavor, right? It's like uh, if you compare the cost of developing software between somebody that would develop, I don't know, a video game or a website, and, 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 and something that somebody that would develop an ISO 2662 grade software, it may be 1 to 100 or something like that, it needs eight. But this is the reason why it's it somewhat okay you know, flying a plane, which is not ISO, it's a different standard, similar concepts, or driving a car. Mm -hmm. Now, moving on to the reference process, it is very difficult to develop for those standard. And they're not too prescriptive, so there's a lot of interpretation uh, when you look at them and say, oh, how well am I going to answer to this objective or the standard and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. Companies usually are quite secretive in, in the process that they apply to answer to the ISO requirements. So what NVIDIA did was, I believe, was quite unique. They did two things. Number one, they published mm -hmm. their Spark process. So this is, as far as I'm aware of, the first time that uh, an industrial like that publishes their secret source, publishes their, their recipe, and say, hey, this is what you can follow to achieve this higher level of uh, safety. So that, that's, that's absolutely remarkable in Spark. Right. The other thing that's remarkable is that the process they publish is unique in the sense that it describes how to apply ADA and how to apply Spark on formal methods to an ISO process, which, which again is, is a first. But I don't think that NVIDIA is uh, particularly shy in, in being first at something. So this is definitely, you know, I'm leading the pack here. So then the, the third part of your questions, which is what is Spark relevance there? Well, Spark, ADA and Spark, if you will, it's more than just another programming language. It's another way to develop software where verification finds its way to the core of the development. Like every developer has to have Spark in mind, have to have verification in mind as they type code. Otherwise, they're not going to uh, achieve an, an, the level of, of reliability and, and make the tool happy, right? And it's extremely valuable in this very high integrity context because the, the level of integrity that you're going to achieve with something with Spark is a lot higher than what you would achieve with mere tests. And arguably, once you have, you know, once you adopted the tools, when you set up the pool plans, the, the pipeline, once you added the right training and, and everything, right, you can also uh, hope to be even more efficient, like to save costs because using formal pool, because to other methodology in particular, because of the way it's going to crush the odds of having certain category of problems at integration time or post deployment. What an answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. My next question is, what is next for Adacore? What should the people know about the direction that you're going in now? So um, one of our first directions is language. So we're going to continue to push around data, around Spark, uh, make the language more modern, make the language more usable, make the tool set around this language uh, more modern and usable. Uh, that, that's one axis on which we're going to continue to push. But we're also working on uh, enlarging our tool set, if you will, our language set, we want to really provide solutions for people that have this high integrity embedded system needs at large, and not just for ADA. So right now we have a REST offering, uh, and our job is to expand that REST offering to make sure that it matches our offering on the ADA side. So that's going to be a, another big direction for us. Uh, and last, uh, overall, we're looking at extending the capabilities of our Tools in particular from the verification standpoint, right? Having more mm -hmm. for testing, more tool for static analysis. Again, to support that that market, that user kind that that we care about as a company, which are people that have the highest level of reliability, security, or safety needs ahead of them. Amazing. Quinn, it was very good to talk to you today. Really, you're a man who's at the bleeding edge of ADA science. I mean, it's just insane that, you know, NVIDIA now has released this new reference process. I can see this just exploding in popularity into the future. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. If you'd like to know more about the ADA programming language, view the new ISO 26262 reference protocol, or learn more about ADA Core and how they're simplifying the lives of ADA developers, give the description a peek.
Let us know in the comments what you thought. Like, subscribe, and as always, stay disruptive.